Okay, let's get back to it again. When should we have the conversation? As I told you, one of the things we did with the Medical Society, we got about 100 doctors out one night over at the Atlantis Country Club. A familiar site for many of you. And uh, we entitled it Death Over Dinner. And it was an opportunity we broke out and, you know, each table had like eight or ten people. And we had some very intimate discussions talking about uh, family members who passed away who were very important to us, just kind of breaking the ice. And it was, it was a very, very uh, interesting discussion. But that same concept, the people who do the conversation project, you can check their websites, get some really interesting things go all around the country, having various events. One of them is death over dinner to me is, is important because it emphasizes how important it is to have these talks early. Like we said before, always too soon until it's too late. The kitchen table is much better than waiting for a crisis. It's you know, certainly best when you're not critically ill and there's not so many family dynamics and emotions uh, involved. Uh, again, what I said before, I've written in my notes, you pass the meatloaf, how do you want to die? Okay. There's a thought there. Uh, there's also other times that you might consider needing to have the conversation. And like I said, we have these uh, conversation starter kit booklets that will be given out. Uh, before a long trip, you can speak to your children at this time. You might mention this is an important gift. Kids always like to get gifts that we want to give you. And it could be a challenging conversation, but it can lead once again to a very intimate conversation. And it gives you a time that you can discuss uh, not only end of life wishes, but what else is important in your life. Now, I'll mention in this book again, this is a great book. I use this when I began the conversation with my wife, because here I give these lectures, but to do it in my own life is challenging. Okay, because another, I'm a human being, so it's challenging. Uh, they make it so easy. Uh, you don't need a technical degree to go through this. They break it into four steps. Get ready, get set, having the conversation, go, and then keep going. Because these conversations are things that evolve. What's good for you today, you may have a different needs 10 years from now, 5 years from now, or 20 years from now. There's, there's some really good questions in the booklet, such things about uh, when you think about the end of life, what matters the most to you? Who would you want to make decisions for you if you couldn't make them for yourself? Where would you want to be at the time of your death, at home, in a hospital? And of course, that question, do you want everything, every extreme measure to be taken? The whole enchilada, another day, another week, a month of life, or would there actually come a time when you would want just comfort care? So these are the type of questions that are in this booklet, and it's worded so well, it just makes it really easy to do. So I'll encourage a few moments here of audience participation with, with one of the questions here from the book. Uh, what matters to me most at the end of my life is? So if you could think of an answer in five words or less, I'll give you a few sample answers, maybe something like, uh, at the end of my life, being able to recognize my children, to be in a hospital with excellent nursing care. Anyone want to take a stab at what would be important to you at the end of your life? Five words or less. Or less. Be an organ donor. Be an organ donor. Okay, that, that would be an important thing that everyone should know about. Not to be on a ventilator. To not be on a ventilator. We want to make that really clear. Carrie. <laughs> make it easy for my family to say goodbye. Okay. And make it easy for my family to say goodbye. And what would be the next step that you might want to take it to? Specify. Well, that would be part of the conversation. Okay. So this is just begin to get your minds thinking, because it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to jump right in, particularly when we have 50, 60 people in the room to come out, but start thinking about these things here. <coughs> now, the conversation can go in a lot of different directions. We can speak as adults to our parents. We might present it in the context of the question, what would be most important to you at the end of your life so I can honor your wishes and I can have the burden of not knowing what you want lifted from me. Again, you'll find a lot of these tips in this book. Another way of phrasing that and speaking to one's parents might be something like this. I know you don't want to talk about this, but there may come a time when I have to make a decision for you, and I will need your help. 
put it that way, what parent would ever refuse a child to request for help? So it's all how you word these things, and again, with this conversation started kid, it makes it pretty easy for you. The other way, speaking as an adult to your children, perhaps adult children, you might put it into this context, about giving a gift. We're really giving you a gift to knowing what's important to us at the end of our lives, so that you don't ever have to have a burden of wondering or questioning what's important to myself or to us. Never a question so that you will feel like you can honor what's important to us. So it's all in the context you put it in. It really helps to get these conversations going. And, you know, we refer back to the lady with the nail. You ask those questions, and then keep your mouth shut and kind of listen to see what reaction people are having. So these are just slides to illustrate young and old, every ethnicity, families together, different generations. Conversations are important. Another element that goes along with this, as we said, helping you to choose who should make those decisions for you if and when it comes to the point that you can't make those decisions. That's a really important thing to do because statistics show, particularly among people 65 and up, almost half of those individuals when they're admitted to the hospital are not in a state that they can make decisions for themselves. So it's really important to have what we call a health care proxy or health surrogate in different states that got different legal nomenclature for this, but this is something that is very important to 